The trees uh, be behind are quite distinct characteristics. The first ones are Huntingdon Elm. The taller ones are part of an avenue that has been uh, in decline. We've lost some trees to tree decay fungus and also elm disease. The taller ones are a fine examples of Ulmus minor sarniensis. Sarnia was the Roman name for Guernsey and uh, the name is reflected in the common name of uh, Jersey or Guernsey elms. English elm, uh, strange enough, isn't actually a native of this country and were probably introduced by the Romans uh, who brought uh, vines in supported on elm stakes and it's from those um, viable living elm stakes that uh, our English elm population has probably sprung. The tree behind is a, a weeping elm, but these large leaves actually show that all elms, apart from a couple of uh, rare species that are not likely to be seen, have this asymmetrical lobing on the leaves. So if you were to look at trees and you find the long lobe and short lobe at the end of the leaf stalk, you're fairly, fairly certain that that would be an elm tree. Here we are in a small dell in the Coronation Garden at Preston Park. The trees that you can see here are the Preston Twins. That's a local name for arguably the oldest surviving English elms uh, in Europe, reputed to be about 400 years old. The trees are completely hollow um, and therefore they, they don't reflect the true nature of English elm because we have to prune them quite regularly to actually keep the canopy lighter and to prevent uh, the wind resistance snapping them uh, and also the, the weight if we left it to grow naturally would probably collapse these quite fragile stems now. On, on the uh, tree behind there is a, a large protuberance um, where people have actually taken photographs um, they phoned us up or written to us and said did, did we know we have a dragon's head uh, on them I think um, with a little bit of imagination it is possible to actually uh, see that. In 1926 when there was an epidemic in this country um, and then that died out and became endemic, at that time the fungus that was uh, the causative fungus um, didn't necessarily kill the elm trees. Elm trees could produce um, a substance called tylosis, a, a dark sort of gummy substance that could block um, the passage of the fungus through the whole tree system so it could often isolate the fungus in one limb and that would die off and it would either drop off or tree surgeons would take that off at a, a different time as part of the maintenance. We had to uh, look at our resource. Um, we are in Brighton and Hove now, both reliant on hundreds and thousands of elm trees planted by our forebears to cope with our coastal conditions and our thin chalk soils. In a way Brighton and Hove were um, already at that time uh, an area of high interest in terms of elm species cultivars and, and varieties. From the late 60s a new virulent form of the fungus was introduced on imports of Canadian rock elm, almost Tomasii. The difference was from the old fungus was that the trees in producing their natural mechanism, the tylosis, didn't react quickly enough and so the fungus passed through to the whole tree system, killing trees very rapidly. Death of the elm trees was so quick and the, the, the problem so enormous um, that um, it was virtually too late. All of a sudden we had 17 trees the first year and then that escalated and by the 80s we were losing hundreds of trees a year. There was no government response at that time um, that could actually arrest that and so in southern England especially in a very short space of time millions and millions of elms died. We realised at that time that the cost uh, environmental terms was uh, huge um, because of our reliance on, on elm stock. We looked at the cost of defeat. If we did nothing and lost all of our elms, had to reinstate pavements and uh, replant parks and, and streets up, 18 to 22 million pounds. That would be the cost of defeat now. That got the politicians actually uh, supporting us fully. Politicians, senior officers and 
um, agriculture officers from both sides meeting in what we called DEDCO, which was the Dutch Elm Disease Combined Operations Meetings. And uh, East Sussex County Council and Easterbourne also um, attended those meetings. And uh, what we did was, um, instead of all of us having different uh, posters, um, having different ways of working, we came up with one way that we thought was feasible um, to control the disease and lessen the effects. What we started to do was um, increasing our inspection regime so that if we found infection in one branch and if we could get it about 10 or 15 percent we could put our arborists up to actually prune out in advance of the tylosis which causes staining and then keep pruning out until clear wood and we found that we had used to have about 84% um, success rate on that and we knew then that we were actually winning. Very early on we convinced the politicians there was no point in putting thousands of pounds of public money into dealing with trees in parks and streets when uh, the infection resource uh, was there in private gardens so we could have cleared Preston Park and the tree you know, across the way in somebody's private garden could have reinfected everything the next day. And um, so that's, that's in, in that respect, it's been uh, a mainstay. Once a, a tree is colonised by elm bark beetles, it's possible for two or three thousand new beetles to come out and uh, they carry the fungal spores stuck to their bodies and when they fly to un uh, healthy trees to, to actually feed on them, they inoculate the fungal spores in into the new tree. Undoubtedly the fact that the downs are virtually elm free has been helpful but our main uh, threat has always been from the west um, right down through the Chichester Plain, Worthing, uh, Shoreham. Now in a lot of those areas all of the trees are dead, um, no breeding material, the, the beetle population lessens and so the threat just disappears. Nearer to home we've had um, Ada District Council have been supported of us and they have been our last sort of um, sanitation border and they've done a lot of work there. And it's vital they keep taking the infected trees out because it's protecting our western boundary. People have been looking at producing more resistant trees. What we have to remember is that trees are known to be resistant, that, hence the names. They are inoculated with the elm disease fungus and for the National Collection we have been buying in those trees or obtaining those uh, for a number of years. We could say that with 19,000 elms being retained that we also um, you know, could be uh, providing that. But is it a fact that um, that tree is resistant or are 19,000 trees are, are resistant or is it a fact that it just hasn't been um, subjected to, to elm disease as yet? The chances of the National Collection existing in Brighton and Hove over the next uh, 50 to 100 years I, I still think is, is highly realistic. Somebody may come up with a, a solution or there may be a natural uh, reason why the actual disease actually dies out itself. So all the time we retain this resource there's a chance of you know, outside influences also being um, important.